All right, everybody. <coughs> Rick, I've given everybody a couple of minutes to come in. Um, I know it's nine o'clock on the, the last day, so I hope everyone's had their coffee, especially after last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not working. Need a second cup. All right, so let's get started, shall we? So good morning. Thanks for everyone for coming. Um, my name is Daniel Chambers, and until recently, I was a senior consultant at Redify. But recently, in the last couple of weeks, in fact, this would be my third week, um, I started a new job at Liberty Financial uh, to help them along their functional programming journey. So you might see why I changed jobs, because FP. Um, my background is as a .NET developer, starting, at, starting in C Sharp. Um, however, over the last few years, um, I've become a bit, of a bit of a functional programming nut. Uh, I didn't learn any functional programming at university, unfortunately, so when I learned F Sharp, uh, it was a brand new experience for me. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I got a fantastic opportunity uh, to write shipping production software in Haskell. And this opened my eyes to a completely new way of writing software, um, and Haskell became my new favorite programming language. So hopefully today I can impart to you uh, some of the reasons why I love writing code in Haskell. Uh, and why I think that more people should consider it, consider it as a viable uh, functional programming language. So developers, we're human. We're smart, creative, ingenious people. We like taking complex problems, breaking them down and writing solutions for them. We use abstractions to help us manage the increasing complexity of our software problems. We strive to do our best and be constantly improving. However, being human, we also make mistakes. We oversimplify, we overcomplicate, and we miss edge cases. And most importantly, we forget things. There's nothing wrong with this, it's just a part of our human nature. And we're not blind to our shortcomings. We always create tools to help us overcome our deficiencies. We created fire to keep us warm, wheels to allow us to move around more easily, writing to allow us to remember beyond our fallible memories, machines to amplify our strength and make us more productive, electricity to power our machines and our homes, and of course, most recently, computers to amplify our minds. The history of software development is one of continual improvement. The first pieces of software that we wrote were simple, but now, decades later, the scale and complexity of software far dwarfs anything that we've done in the past. And just like throughout history, we manage this through developing better tools to allow us fallible humans to manage this complexity. We used to write code in raw assembly, but soon progressed onto high level languages like C. The abstractions that structured programming introduced allowed us to write more complex software, letting the tool take care of some of the details and check our thinking during the compilation process. Soon after came C++ and more generally object-oriented programming, which enabled greater complexity by giving us the tools of encapsulation and abstraction. Managed memory runtime such as the JVM and .NET soon arrived to take care of the complexity of memory management, and JavaScript, once a simple scripting language for the web, has been continually improved and forked with sister languages like TypeScript adding more tooling, such as static typing to help with managing complexity and correctness. Even with this continual improvement of our tools, software, en software engineering as an industry still has problems with managing complexity, and in particular, ensuring the software that we write is correct. There are so many industry jokes about it, but a recent XKCD comic that you may have seen really highlighted it for me when it compared software to other disciplines with taking a stab at would you really trust voting software with uh, your democracy? I think the answer would probably be a resounding no because of uh, our really, really bad um, track record at security. Change is a constant in our industry, and like the tide against the cliffs, over time it grinds our software down into a brokey, broken, buggy, unmanageable mess. As developers, we find it difficult to safely modify our software over time to adapt to changing requirements, while ensuring that it still works uh, as intended. We forget or fail to recognize edge cases, and we forget some, sometimes why something was written the way it was, and we might not understand code that someone else had written. And we know this, so we employ more tools to help us. Compilers, unit tests, continuous integration pipelines, automated deployments. But let's not forget the humble programming language. A good language should help us express our intention clearly so that others can understand it. It should only allow us to express our intention in a way that minimizes mistakes. And it should, wherever possible, verify what we have written is correct. 
It should allow us to think with precision, never allowing us to forget important edge cases. I believe functional programming and FP languages, especially Haskell, are the next step in the, our evolution of our language tools. FP can help us manage software complexity, resilience to change and quality. Functional programming has become more and more popular over time as mainstream languages like C Sharp, C++, JavaScript and Java all adopt functional programming features and ideas. More fully functional languages like Haskell, F Sharp and Scala are gaining popularity as people recognize the advantages that functional programming brings. Things like functions as first class objects that allow us to more easily compose and reuse code in ways that make sense. A declarative programming style that allows us to lift our level of abstraction up and focus on expressing our business logic and not writing plumbing code. And purity and immutability provide us guarantees that allow us to write code that's more testable and maintainable. Horrible global mutable state is eliminated and you can more easily reason about your code when your functions are pure and have no side effects. And immutability also gives us that double benefit of making it easier to write concurrent code that is correct and without race conditions because it's not possible for two threads to mutate the same state. Haskell is a language that embodies functional programming principles. Unlike a language like F Sharp or Scala, which straddle the fence between an object-oriented language and a functional one, Haskell is a pure functional language that epitomizes functional ideals. So let's take a tour of Haskell's features that help us write quality software that is correct, understandable, and easily refactorable. So number one, Haskell is a statically typed language. And this means that it has a type system that is enforced and, in and checked by the compiler at compile time. People still debate dynamic versus static languages, but I think one only needs to look at the JavaScript ecosystem to see the value of a statically typed language. People have literally had to make new statically typed language that compile to JavaScript, such as TypeScript, in order to be able to manage larger and larger JavaScript code bases. Dynamic typing can be fine for small scripts, throwaway prototypes, and for quick coding, but for quality non-trivial software, developers need static types in order to help them manage complexity. John DeGoes has commented on Twitter that an underpowered type system forces one to program defensively. And I think anyone who's used a type system like C Sharps and Java's will know this feeling. Having to do null checks and type test is busy work, yet is easily forgotten and a source of annoying bugs. On the other hand, a powerful type system liberates the developer to make changes with confidence, knowing that the type system will validate his or her cor code for correctness. John calls this fearless programming. Haskell has an extremely powerful and strict type system. As a consequence, Haskell forces you to write code that is correct and rejects code that is not. Now, this might seem arduous as you write code in comparison to a dynamically typed language, but what it means is you actually spend far less time debugging errors at runtime. It's somewhat of an in-joke that within Haskell, if it compiles, it probably works, but I've actually found this to be the case far more often than not. One of the annoyances of static typing can be constantly having to tell the compiler the type of, what it, the type of things as you write code. You have to repeat it over and over. Thankfully, Haskell has a very powerful type inference engine that can infer the types of your values and functions by looking at the context of what it is that you've actually written. So up on the slide, we've got a function called print error message, and that takes a message parameter and it prints to the console. That message parameter and the error value are both have both been inferred to be of type string, and this is because the compiler can figure that out by looking at the context of where they've been used. So the message parameter is passed to that string concatenation function, which is the plus plus operator. And that error is passed to put string line, which itself takes a string. And the print error message function itself is inferred to return the type IO of unit, because that's what pure, that puts str line returns. However, this type inference can be a double-edged sword. If your code is not correct as you write it, the compiler may infer incorrect types for things which can make compiler error messages much harder to understand because it'll be telling you about types that you didn't actually intend to, to write. But it's also much harder to understand code when the types aren't there and everything's inferred. Good naming of variables can help carry you for a while, but nothing beats a good type to describe exactly what something is. Other languages like F Sharp will try to, try to resolve this issue through tooling. So if you use the VS Code extension Ionide in F Sharp, 
um, it'll display the type signature for functions above them in line in the code to help you understand the code as you're reading it. However, this doesn't help you when you're reviewing code in another editor or in GitHub in a PR, for example. Haskell solves these issues by allowing people to explicitly add type signatures to functions. And this helps resolve the issue of when you're writing code and you've got a little bit wrong and type inference is messing up your compiler error messages because the incorrect types are, are slipping in. So you start writing a function by defining its desired type signature. And then as you write the function, the compiler can help you fill in the blanks using type inference. And this actually changes the way you write code whereby you let the compiler guide you by looking at the error messages that it gives you back to determine what you need to do next in your function to satisfy the type signature that you started with. By having that type signature actually in the code, it also means you can read the code directly on GitHub or in any, any editor that you like and still be able to see these type signatures because they're just text in a text file. For me, after having this, it's going back and reading f -sharp code is a bit harder because I can't see the type of functions when I view the code on GitHub. In Haskell, type signatures are just there for me to read. And because they're written separately above the function, it keeps the actual code clean and concise without cluttering it with type information. The type signatures also act as documentation for a function. So you can very often look at a function and tell what it does and how to use it simply by inspecting its type signature. So we can see that the print error message function does IO because it returns the IO type. Another good example is the function zip, and that's type signatures up on the slide at the bottom. By reading that type signature, we can see that it takes a list of A's, and the list is the, uh, the square bracket syntax, and it takes a list of B's, so it takes two parameters, and it will return a list of AB pairs, so that's a tuple of A and B. We can intuit that this means that it combines those two lists together and produces a single list of the elements paired together, and we can tell that just by looking at the types. The A's and B's there are generic types, so this function could be used with a list of strings and a list of ints, for example, and it would return a list of string int pairs. This descriptiveness of the type system provides uh, unexpected benefits. So the Haskell ecosystem has a search engine called Hoogle, which allows you to search for functions by their type signatures. So let's try an example. Imagine we want a function that takes a list, transforms each element, and then also filters the list at the same time. So you can think about it as a, a where and a select together. f -sharp people might recognize that as a choose function, but if we're new to Haskell, we might not know what it's actually called in the Haskell standard libraries. And this is where Google can come in and help us. We can write out the type signature for that function. So the first parameter is a function itself that transforms each element A into a B and can optionally discard it, and that's where that maybe type comes in. So maybe we'll keep it the B or not. The second parameter is an input list of A's, and the return type is a list of transformed and filtered B's. So when I put that type signature into Hoogle, it immediately returns a set of matching functions and right at the top is the one that I want, which is the map maybe function from the data maybe module. And that's pretty cool. So Hoogle is incredibly useful to see whether there's a function out there that does what you need rather than you implementing it yourself. A lot of the time you're just able to pull in a library that does what you want. And it's also super useful when you're learning and you don't know where all the basic functions are. You can just ask Hoogle, I need a function that does this, you type its type signature in and it'll give you a list of matching functions and it does a fuzzy match as well. So if you don't get it quite right, it might find you one that's close. Another static typing feature that Haskell offers is to help you write an under understandable and correct code is something called a sum type. A sum type is a type that expresses a fixed set of alternatives. So another way of saying this is that a sum type allows you to make a choice between different things. So you can define an explicit choice between A, B, and C. A typical example is modeling the presence or absence of a value. So Haskell does this with the maybe type which can either be just with a value or nothing without a value. So the syntax up on the slide is saying that we have a data type called maybe. Uh, it has a generic parameter that we're calling a, and it can either be a value called just that has, contains a value of whatever the type a is, or it can be a value called nothing, which doesn't have anything associated with it. So when we have a maybe value, we can use Haskell's pattern matching syntax, which is that case of syntax, to see whether the maybe we have at hand is actually a just or a nothing, 
and then do something different in each case. That maybe type is actually built into the Haskell base library, so you don't need to write it yourself, but that's pretty much all it is. The either sum type uh, is also built in, and it offers the ability to model a choice between two different values. So we can either be a left, which can contain whatever type A is, or right, which can contain whatever type B is. The either sum type is often used to model error handling. So for example, either error int is a type that could either be left with an error or right with an int. Of course, you can define your own sum types to model uh, alternatives in your domain accurately. So for example, we could make um, an, an error type that models the different errors that we get when we validate a file path. So it could exceed the max length of a path and we could pass along the, the actual length that it, that it was. Uh, it could use invalid characters and we could also pass along the length of the, the invalid characters that it did use. Or it could just be an empty string where we don't really need to put any associated data with it. We could then write a parse file path function that takes that string, validates it, and then returns either a path validation or a valid file path. And that's what the type signature up on the slide is, is saying. So a typical way of writing code like this in a language like C Sharp might be to use exceptions. We've probably all seen a method similar to this at some point uh, where you've got, um, you pass a string to this validate file path uh, method and it will either just do nothing or throw an exception um, with the, probably the error inside that exception type. Now unfortunately with that sort of form we have no way of knowing what sort of errors uh, to expect from that validate file path uh, method without reading its implementation or perhaps its documentation. The type signature there doesn't mention the exception at all that could be thrown. So we can see how some types can be used to make error handling explicit and indeed can be used to make any alternatives in your code uh, explicit in the types. And this is also useful when you change your code. So if you add an alternative to a some type, the compiler will tell you all the places in your code that you need to update to account for that new alternative and it'll do that through compiler warnings and typically that's one of the compiler warnings you turn into an error. So this is a really good example of how Haskell helps you refactor your code safely because you can go and modify these some types in the future and the compiler will tell you all the places that you need to update. In fact, through the use of some types, Haskell eliminates that annoying null reference exception that we get in languages like C Sharp and JavaScript. In C Sharp, any reference type can be null. In Haskell, null isn't a thing at all. It doesn't even exist. If you need to model the potential absence of something, then you use the maybe type. And this means in Haskell, you opt in to nullability. If you try to pass a maybe to a function that doesn't take a maybe, you get a type error. So the compiler won't let you do it. Um, if a function returns a maybe and you don't deal with it, then you get a compile error. So this contrasts against a language like C Sharp where you have, you have opt out nullability and you have to end up doing busy work in error prone coding such as checking for unexpected nulls and throwing exceptions to work around it. The compiler doesn't stop you from passing null where you shouldn't and you find out at runtime uh, with a crash. If you call a function and you get back a null but you don't code for it, then you get a crash at runtime. <coughs> Have a look at the Haskell and C Sharp list find type signatures up on the slide. In the Haskell version of find, it's impossible to pass maybes to that function because it doesn't take maybes. Um, and you explicitly get back a maybe to represent if you weren't able to find whatever it was you were looking for in that list. You can't get at the contents of that maybe unless you do a pattern match. Um, so, you know, you literally have to handle the case where you didn't find something. The language forces you to do it. In the C-sharp version, you can pass null for that predicate and you'll get an argument null reference, uh, sorry, an argument null exception at, at runtime. You can also get back null from that function and unless you explicitly check for null being returned, you could get a null reference exception. So this is just one of the many ways that Haskell uses its strict and powerful static type system to ensure that you're writing correct and bug-free code. By making such concepts explicit in the types, developers can clearly understand the implications and the edge cases of using functions, which means that they can write and refactor code more safely and confidently. Another powerful feature of using the Haskell static type system is the ability to find new types. A new type is a data type that simply wraps an existing type. 
And this is useful when you want to add new meaning to an existing type. So a good example is an email address. An email address is just a string, but it's not just any string. It's a string that must match a certain format. So you can define a new type called email address that wraps a string, and then you can pass around email address instead. And this means that you can write a validation function that takes a normal string and checks if it's a valid email address and then returns either an error or a valid wrapped email address. So that parse email address uh, type signature on the slide is an example of what that might look like. Once you've got a valid wrapped email address, you can pass that around and use it safely in all subsequent code. The compiler prevents you from passing a string to a function that expects an email address because a string and an email address are not the same type. The email address is a new type. Code that takes an email address can know that it doesn't need to deal with invalid email addresses, which simplifies the code and helps eliminate bugs. It also makes your type signatures far more descriptive, which helps the understandability of the code. So have a look at the send email type signature, and this is kind of an extreme example, but you can see that it takes an email address, a subject, and a body just from the types. If this was just string, 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 that'd be far less useful. We can't accidentally pass a body where the subject would go, or vice versa. That would be a compiler error, because subject and body aren't the same type. And the best thing about new types in Haskell is that they're cost-free at runtime. The compiler, after type checking, will actually substitute the unwrapped type so that there are no extra memory allocations needed for that wrapper type at all. And this is unlike in other languages where wrapper types often have a runtime performance and memory penalty. So here's a practical example of where new types can help imp improve code clarity. On a past gig, I saw some code in a class that talked to an API that deals with some IoT devices. The developer who wrote the code made a responsive T class to represent either some error return, so, sorry, some data that's returned by that API call, so that would be whatever the T is, or an error if, uh, in a string if, that, if something happened to that API call. He had some methods that called that, that backing API, so I put the type signature for a couple of them up there. Uh, one was called get devices, and it returns a responsive string. It turns out that string was actually the entire JSON body of the HTTP response. He also had get device serial, which uh, got the serial number of a device given a particular ID, but it also returned a response to string, except in this case the string was a serial number. So straight away we can see some issues with this code, right? Both methods ostensibly return the same thing, but it's not really the same thing, and it's hard to tell what they actually return without looking, the impl well, looking at the implementation of those methods. The response type also doesn't stop you from having a null data or an error or even both data or error being set at the same time. In C-sharp, to create a wrapper type around those strings to distinguish between a JSON string and a device serial, you need to create a new class. But this is kind of ugly because it incurs an extra memory allocation. That value, that value property could still be null. Um, and you can't compare that type for quality like you can the string. So you can fix all those issues, but it requires lines and lines of tedious and error-prone code. In Haskell, this is a non-issue. We can simply create cost-free new, new type wrappers for all of those types, and we can use the either type to, to model that alternative between a success and a failure. We could even create a sum type for the error to explicitly describe the set of errors that we expect uh, rather than just using a string. So straight away, it's now clear what our functions take and what they return. So we can see with our get devices, we can tell that it does some IO because there's an IO type and it can return either an error or a JSON string. And then when we look at get the get device serial, we can see that it takes a device ID and it does some IO and it will return either an error or a device serial. So I can look at those immediately, know what I need to pass them and I know what they return. So again, Haskell is helping us write understandable and correct code through its strict and expressive static type system. So, variables. Variables are moving parts in our code, and we know that undisciplined use of variables can result in code that's very difficult to reason about and therefore get correct and bug-free and maintain into the future. Working with immutable data structures can simplify code by removing those moving parts in our code, the variables. It's not that immutable data structures don't change, it's, a, it's just that they operate on a copy on write basis. So modifying an immutable data structure results in a new copy being created that incorporates those modifications. 
And this isn't necessarily as inefficient as it sounds, as many data structures, immutable data structures, will reuse a large part of the old data structure in the new version. So for example, a Haskell list is a singly linked list. So adding a new element to the list simply means adding a new node to the front of the existing data structure. And as you can see up on the slide, list A hasn't changed at all, but list B includes list A's nodes inside itself. All data types in Haskell are immutable. It's not possible to create mutable data types in Haskell at all. And this guarantee takes a lot of complexity and unknowns out of your code immediately. You never need to worry about whether a type might be mutable and therefore whether you need to worry about it being mutated unexpectedly. If I pass a data structure to a function, it is 100% guaranteed that that function can't mess with it. If I pass a list to a method in C-sharp, for example, I don't get a guarantee that that method isn't going to modify the list, or it might even modify something inside the list. In Haskell, as a function author, if I, I know that if I'm passed something, I can safely use it without worrying that something else that I don't know about, perhaps on another thread, might change that thing that I have. I don't have to check that assumption. In Haskell, it's a guarantee. So Haskell has language features that make it really easy to work with immutable data structures. So up on the slide, I've defined a Haskell record type called book that contains uh, title and author fields. We can then define a function called change title that takes a new title and an old book and creates a new book based on the old book and just changes the title on it. So Haskell will take care of copying all the other fields on that, uh, on that book, such as the author for us, and that works uh, even if there are more fields there. So if we had 10 extra fields on that book record type, that change title code wouldn't change, it all, wouldn't change at all. It would stay the same, and the compiler would just behind the scenes copy those extra fields for us. And this is in stark contrast to languages like C Sharp, well, where working and creating immutable data structures is extremely tedious. You need to create a class with read-only properties, you need a constructor that'll take all the values and set the properties, and you need to do, write methods to manually do that copy on write. It's so painful, it's not surprising that nobody does it. Functions take input and they return output. A pure function is one that does no side effects and that when given the same input will always deterministically return the same output. Impure functions are harder to maintain and reason about because they depend upon shared state. So in order to think about what an impure function does, you have to kind of expand your mind to encompass every other piece of code that modifies that shared state with it, um, as well as that impure function that you're trying to understand at hand. Pure functions, by contrast, can be viewed and understood entirely in isolation. Their type signatures give a very strong signal as to what they do, which is really nice when it comes to maintainability because I don't need to dive into implementations to see what something does. You can just look at the types of a pure function and go, oh yeah, I kind of see what that thing does. And there's no fear to, that they might be, doing, might be doing some invisible side effects in its implementation that you actually do need to know about. So if we look at that map function type signature up on the slide, which we've seen before, but you might recognize it as select from C sharp, uh, we can see that we give it uh, a, a function that converts an A into a B, and we, can, and we also give it a list of A's, and it will return back to us a list of B's. So the A and B here are abstract, uh, and that's like generics in C Sharp or Java. There's no type casting in Haskell. So when a function receives an abstract type like an A or a B, it literally can do nothing with it at all because it doesn't know what it, doesn't know what it is. It, to it, it's just, this is an A. I don't know anything more about it. In this case, the map function can do nothing with an A or a B except for one thing. It can convert an A into a B. And that's only because it was given a function that can convert an A into a B. So as someone looking at this function, you know that there cannot be any black magic going on inside this function at all that could bite you. Because all data types are immutable in Haskell, you know the list that this produces must be a new list, and that original list that you pass it will remain untouched. You don't need to check the documentation or the implementation to know this. And this strictness gives you confidence as a developer to know what a function can do without checking its implementation for unexpected behavior. It means you can write and refactor code with confidence. This is in contrast to other less strict FP languages, like F Sharp, for example. If I see a function in F Sharp, there's no guarantee that that function doesn't modify some static variable 
or mutate its input parameters or perform any other side effects inside itself. Now, it's good practice in F-sharp to not do that and to work with immutable data types. But because mutability imp and impurity are allowed in the language, you don't have that absolute guarantee like you do in Haskell. You lose a level of trust and you have to spend a bit more time checking your assumptions. So for example, look at the F-sharp version of the change title function up on the slide. I can see that it takes a new title um, and an existing book and it returns a book. But unless I check that book is actually in a mutable type, I have no guarantee that this function is actually pure. So for example, book might be a mutable class type and change title might be mutating that input book and returning it. Now this would be very poor form in F-sharp and if I found it in a PR, that PR would be sent back <laughs> and you would have to change that to an immutable, uh, immutable type, but in F-sharp it is possible. So you lose that level of trust. In Haskell, this is impossible because mutability doesn't exist. So Haskell's restrictions of requiring immutability and purity actually benefit the developer by ensuring that he or she can make safe assumptions about how code works. Immutability and pure functions also aid us in writing testable code. So pure functions are naturally testable because they don't have any side effects. If you give a, few, a, if you give a pure function the same input, it will always deterministically return the same output, which makes it super easy to test. You just pass your input and assert that it returns what you expect. Pretty simple. As a contrast, impure code that has side effects either can't be tested or it must have those side effects mocked out and carefully managed, resulting in complex and fragile tests. Pure code is also very easy to make concurrent. The biggest issue with writing concurrent code is dealing with race conditions where two threads will modify the shared state in unexpected ways and at unexpected times. Because pure code only works with immutable data types, it's impossible for multiple threads running pure code uh, to interfere with each other since because this mutable state just doesn't exist. So Haskell's purity guarantee, that means you can trust that any pure functions are safe to use in concurrent parts of your application. They can't modify any shared state by definition, which means that you know for sure that whole classes of race conditions are just not possible. You don't need to check, you can just use it and, and it works. This is another Haskell guarantee that gives you confidence that you're writing correct code. So purity is all well and good, but your program's kind of useless unless it can actually do some side effects and affect the real world. So if Haskell's so pure, how do we manage impurity? So a function for getting the current time is a good simple example. On the slide up at the top, there's a function that takes unit, which is a bit like void, and it returns the current time. However, that function is actually impossible in Haskell, since for that function to return a different UTC time, each time it's called with the same input, so the same void, it's like unit, it would have to violate purity because pure functions must be deterministic. Given the same input, they must return the same output. So given the same unit, I get a different time every time I call it. So this is where Haskell's IO monad comes in. The IO monad allows us to write impure code in a pure way. So to get our current time, uh, our get current time function would probably look more like that. Um, it would return an IO of UTC time. And in fact, because of purity, this function would always have to return the same IO of UTC time anyway, because given the same input, it must return the same output. So we can just drop that input parameter and just have a value instead of a function. And the value is of type IO of UTC time. So how can we use this? Well, let's write something simple that calculates the current time and adds 10 seconds to it. To do this, we can use the bind operator, which kind of allows us to hook a function up that receives the value inside the IO. So here we're using a lambda function, and that's what that slash and arrow syntax is. And that lambda function will take the current time out of the IO and then add 10 seconds to it. This lambda function itself is still pure code. Given the same time, it will always return the same value. The IO type in the signature is a big signal to the developer that there's some impure stuff going on inside this code, which is a big bonus for code readability. Now these IO values are just potential values. To actually run them and see them do IO, you actually have to hook them up to the real world. And we can do this by hooking them up to the program's main entry point. So in the case up on the slide, we've got a little program that reads the current time adds 10 seconds to it, and then prints that to the console and quits. 
So we can now affect the real world by using the I.O. monad. However, this doesn't mean we want to do our entire program inside of I.O. What we want to achieve is the majority of our code to be written outside of I.O. in a pure fashion, and then we connect its edges up to the real world with a little bit of I.O. So in other words, we want to push I.O. to the edges of our application, and this makes our code a lot easier to test and reason about. So here's a micro example of how we could cut up that previous code that we wrote in order to keep the I.O. bits separate from the actual program logic. So notice how we've pu pulled out that pure lambda into a separate function. We can test and reason about that more easily now. Seeing the I.O. type on functions and values is an instant indication that there's some sort of side effect going on inside that code. And this makes the division between impure and pure code very obvious and never a nasty surprise to the developer. And this is important when writing new code or refactoring existing code because you can immediately start thinking about all the additional complexities that side effectful code introduces and be wary. On the flip side, not seeing I.O. means you don't need to think about those complexities at all, so you have that level of trust. Haskell makes it very, very easy to get value semantics for your data types. Now, value semantics is where the identity of an object is determined by its value rather than by the particular instance of the object in memory. So, for example, instance strings in C-sharp have value semantics. I can have the same string, two instances in memory, and if I say equals, they'll be considered to be equal. But by default, classes in C-sharp have reference equality, so if I new up this, the same class, have the same properties on it, unless I override equals, and I, I say if these are equal, we'll go no, because these are two different objects in memory. So when types are mutable, value semantics can be tricky, because equality results can change as the instance mutates. But since everything in Haskell is immutable, it's very easy to start using value semantics. In fact, usually all you need to do is ask the compiler to derive the EQ type class on your type, and you've got equality for free. Have you ever tried to write a test where you need to compare a list of objects or nested object graphs? This is super painful to do without value semantics. You have to compare each list element individually, typically in a loop, and then compare each property individually with your assertion library. Wouldn't it be better if you could just construct the expected result and just go equals? Well, in Haskell, you can. So we could write a unit test that, for example, gets a list of transactions and simply does a comparison between the expected list and the actual list using equals. And that's all the should be function is doing under the covers. It just does an equals. And the other stuff that it does is if it is not equals, it prints out nice things on your test runner. Lists in Haskell are also equatable, so long as what they contain is equatable. So in this case, our transaction data type is equatable because we derived EQ on it. So the lists are also naturally equatable as well, which means that we can just do should be on the two lists and it works. So compare how easy this was to achieve versus how you'd need to do it in F sharp uh, or C sharp. Well, in F sharp it's actually easy, but in C sharp it's a bit more painful. So in C sharp, if we wanted to implement value semantics, um, you'd need to implement equals yourself. And you need to do it for each of your types, and you need to compare each property on the type by hand. And if you added a new property later, you'd better remember to update your equals implementation, or you've got a subtle bug. In Haskell, the compiler takes care of it for you, ensuring that you can easily modify your code with confidence into the future. So if I went and added, say, in the future, a description to my transaction, um, I wouldn't have to change anything except I'd have to modify that test so the compiler would catch me there because I'm creating transactions and not setting a description. So property testing is another thing that's really easy to do in Haskell, especially with value semantics being uh, so easily doable. So property testing is where you can have your test framework generate random input values, and then you write a test to check whether your code works in a certain way for all the generated input values. So in other words, for all inputs, a certain property holds for your code under test. So the textbook example of this is if you're writing tests for a list reversing function. So a property of reversing a list is if you reverse a list twice, you get back what you started. So this property holds no matter what type of list you give the reverse function. So you can see in the code up on the slide, we're passing a lambda function to the, to the property test. So the test framework will call our lambda function over and over and over, and it will pass in empty lists. It'll pass in lists with one things in them. It will pass lists with two things, lists with 10 things, and it will 
do that a number of times. And we assert in our test that the input list is the same as reversing the list twice. Now, if any input causes that assertion to fail, then our property test fails. Properties are particular to your domain. So imagine in our domain, we could say that all invoices must generate at least two transactions. We could write a property test that generates random invoices and checks that our transaction list length is always greater than or equal to two. So property testing is a great way of, to ensure that you're writing correct code that stays correct as you change it over time. Haskell is a lazy evaluation language as opposed to the strict evaluation languages that we'd normally use. This means that you can write code in a way that appears to be inefficient from a strict language point of view, but since Haskell only evaluates what's necessary when it's actually required, your code executes efficiently anyway. Laziness helps you subtly all over the place when you're writing Haskell. So to demonstrate laziness on the slide, we're gonna use the from maybe function. And let's see how that function works before we use it. So from maybe, we'll take a maybe value and a fallback value. And if the maybe exists, then it'll just return what's inside the maybe. So if it's just, it returns it. Um, but if it's nothing, then it returns your fallback value. So for example, here where we pass just something, we get back something. But if we pass nothing, then we get back our fallback value. So you can think of it a bit like null coalesce in C sharp. Now let's see how laziness kicks in when we look at the code at the bottom of the slide. In a strict language, that expensive value would be evaluated before it's passed to from maybe. So we'd pay the cost of calculating that fallback value even though it wasn't necessarily gonna be used. In Haskell, expressions are only evaluated when their value is actually required. So the millionth prime that we're calculating here as the fallback value would only be calculated if the maybe was nothing. If the maybe was just, then we don't need that fallback value, so it will never be calculated. Here's another example. Imagine we're transforming each item in the big list with an expensive calculation. So that weird dollar symbol is map, so like select in, in C sharp. Now, we only want the 101st to the 105th element from that list. We want to drop the first 100 and take the next five. In a strict language, if we wrote it this way, we'd be paying that expensive transform cost for those first, at least the first 100 list elements, the ones that we're dropping on the floor, before we get to the five that we actually want. However, in Haskell, laziness ensures that that transform will only be done when required. So when we eventually look at the five elements that we've picked out of the list, the transform will be done then and only on those five elements. The 100 that we dropped and just lost, that will never do that transform on them. Laziness means that you can write code more declaratively in a way that makes, makes sense, it reads more cleanly, and only the parts that are actually needed are actually run. However, laziness is a double-edged sword. You get those execution efficiencies, but you can also get cut by a new type of memory leak called a space leak. And this is where, because of laziness, you may retain things in memory longer than you expect because the code that would otherwise decide to drop that memory hasn't actually run yet. So on a past Haskell project that I worked on, we had an issue where we loaded a whole bunch of jobs out of a CSV data source and we put them into a map so that we could look them up easily. Now each CSV row that we had uh, contained far more information than we actually needed. It was quite a big CSV. Um, so we only stored the few columns that we actually cared about in our job record type, which you can see up on the slide. However, when we ran this thing, our program used a lot of memory for no apparent reason, even though we were keeping only a few fields from each row. And you can see the chart, the Haskell memory profiler generated for us up on the slides. We, we used a lot of memory and we're like, what? So what was actually happening was that each CSV row was being read, in from read into memory for parsing. However, when we set the properties on those, on those records, such as job ID, the actual parsing of that row in memory to get those fields out of the row in memory was lazy. So until we actually needed the values of the properties on the job record, that parsing wasn't being done because it was lazy. And therefore, the memory holding what was going to be parsed was kept around. So effectively, it did the opposite of what we wanted and loaded the entire CSV into memory until we looked at the jobs and then it went, oh, you actually want to know what the advertiser ID is. Cool, I'll do the parsing now and here's your advertiser ID. 
So we fix this by forcing strictness on each job as we created it. So there is a way in Haskell to say, no, no, actually run this now, please. Um, and that, of course, forced the evaluation of the parsing logic, which now complete, drops the CSV row from memory during garbage collection because we don't need it anymore. And as you can see, we went from over a gigabyte in memory usage down to about 180 meg, which is much more like what we expected. Now, in my mind, space licks are the biggest downside of Haskell. Laziness, while useful pretty much all the time in Haskell, sometimes also makes it harder to reason about the execution time and the memory usage of your code. So you need to keep an eye on it so that you aren't in for any surprises when you're dealing with a large data set or high load. Um, However, I think it's fair to say that for any application that will experience high load or will be using a very large data set, you should probably always be testing it under that load or with that large data set uh, so that that requirement shouldn't be an unusual burden, but it is something to keep an eye on when you're writing Haskell. So developers these days uh, are excited about various language and runtimes that allow them to do asynchronous and concurrent programming more easily. Traditionally, threading and concurrency has been quite difficult to manage by hand. So C Sharp's async await, Node.js's uh, non-blocking IO, and Golang's lightweight Go routines have gotten developers, quite rightly, salivating. Haskell also has a very elegant and powerful handling of asynchrony and concurrency. So Haskell's runtime uses a lightweight threading model, which means that you can spin, spin up and use very like loads and loads of threads with very little overhead. All IO operations in Haskell are non-blocking by default in that they don't block an OS thread. And this means Haskell is asynchronous by default. However, Haskell does give you explicit control over when you go concurrent uh, and when you don't. So for example, that read from web services function up on the slide is asynchronous in that we get each, web each get web response call doesn't block an OS thread. However, that function doesn't perform those, those requests in parallel, it does them sequentially. If you want to go parallel, you can ask the Haskell runtime to perform that I.O. concurrently. And that's what we're doing in read from web services in parallel. Uh, the simple change there is to just pass each I.O. operation, which is the get web response A and get web response B, to concurrently. And then concurrently, we'll execute those two things in parallel and we'll get the response back. Haskell's libraries offer many different functions that make doing things concurrently simple, such as uh, like a function that will take a list of IO operations and run them all in parallel. <coughs> Though Haskell can expose to you its underlying threading model, most of the time you just work with these high level constructs. This means you usually don't mess around with threads yourself, instead you just work with concurrency functions in a kind of async await style of coding. And you let the runtime figure out how to schedule all that stuff the best on your multiple cores. And of course, because there's no mutability in Haskell, writing concurrent code is much easier. So most statically typed languages these days support the concept of generics, or type parameterization. Generic code is extremely useful for expressing abstractions that don't care about the types used within them. So for example, a list of T, where T can be any type at all. Haskell's type system takes this one step further by supporting a feature called higher kinded types. Now you can think of kinds of a way of expressing types of types. So types without generics are just types. But once you introduce generics, you change the kind of a type to be a type function. So a type that takes another type and returns a type, just like a function takes a value and returns a value. And this is why the maybe type has a kind of type arrow type, because it's actually a type function that takes a type and returns a type. So if you call the maybe type by just giving it another type, so like if we write maybe int, then you've actually invoked a type function and you've made a type that's maybe specialized to ints. Higher kinded types is where you can write generic code where the generic type parameters can be higher kinded. So for example, type arrow type or type arrow type arrow type and so on. And you can see in the example up on the slide that the map function is generic over a type called f whose kind is type arrow type. And we can tell the kind is that because we can see f has been passed a and f has been passed b. So it must be a type function. Now, this isn't possible in something like .NET, unfortunately. And you can see where I've tried to write what it might look like in C Sharp, but you can't do that. That will obviously be a compile error. But it is possible in a language like Haskell. Uh, 
So type classes are another Haskell feature that when used with higher kind of types allow us to write some extremely powerful abstractions. These abstractions make our code far less noisy and allow for high levels of code reuse. Don't confuse type classes with OO classes just because it has the word class in there. Type classes are more like traits if you've ever used a language with, that has traits. And maybe you could stretch it and say they're a little bit like interfaces. So let's see one in action. We can define a type class called functor that has a higher kinded type called f and defines a single function called map, which we've seen a number of times now. So just think select in your head. So we can create an instance of this type class for the maybe type. And so that means when we use the map function on maybes, the compiler knows, oh, I know how to implement functor for maybes, and I go here, and this is where my map function is defined. So you can see on the right hand of the, of the slide where we're passing an into string function to the map along with a maybe to convert the int that might be inside the maybe uh, into a string if it's there or not. If we substitute the concrete types into the map type signature, so that's the green line, we can see that A has, is now int, B is string, and F is maybe. And we can implement functor for many more types. So for example, list and IO, and we can use map in exactly the same way. So you can see in each of those in the green type signatures, the only thing that's different is that F is list and IO respectively. And this is very powerful because what it means is that we can write a function that works for any functor. So for example, we could make an into string any functor uh, version of those functions that works for any functor we give it. And we can see in the type signature that we've, we've basically pinned int and string, but we've left f to be abstract. And we're saying that f must be a functor. So type classes let us write functions that are abstract over types and therefore get really good code reusability. It also means that when I look at a function like into string any functor, I have confidence that the only thing that it can do with that f type is use the map function on it. Because the only thing it knows about f is that f is a functor and a functor can do map. This means that I can trust that if I pass the list, it's not gonna mess with that list in an unexpected way. The only thing that can do with it is do a map over it. Again, this clarity and strictness means that we can look at a function and be confident about what it can and can't do and therefore write and refactor code more confidently. There are no surprises or black magic allowed at all. So the nice thing about programming in Haskell is that Haskell is a functional first language. Other functional languages come with the baggage of the non-FP platform that they're built on. So for example, Scala doesn't have mutually recursive functions because the JVM doesn't support tail calls. And this means that recursion, which is a key functional technique, needs to be handled with care in Scala and often worked around with a technique called trampolining to make sure you don't blow the stack. In F Sharp, uh, it doesn't unfortunately support high kind of types because the .NET generic system doesn't support them. And Haskell's doesn't, doesn't, Haskell doesn't suffer from either of these problems because its runtime was designed with functional programming in mind and it doesn't have either of these two limitations. Haskell's runtime also includes a special garbage collector that's built to ha handle the generation and collection of a lot of garbage. And because everything is immutable in Haskell, you can imagine that lots of intermediate garbage values are created during the execution of a program. So Haskell's garbage collector can take advantage of some of the guarantees that function purity provides, and it uses techniques that ensure that lots of garbage that you create in a short amount of time that you then don't use is discarded and cleaned up with a very small cost. Now one of the advantages of using a language like F Sharp is that you can lean on the entire of the .NET ecosystem for libraries, which is really good. But the downside of this is that often you'll be dealing with OO style libraries that love their mutability and where you'd actually rather be dealing with an FP style library that uses functional types like option, which is the maybe in F Sharp, um, and you know, uses immutable types. In Haskell, all the libraries are functional and immutable, so you don't have to compromise. The downside being that sometimes there isn't a library for the, that thing that you want. Now the learning curve of Haskell is one of its disadvantages. Learning a language like F Sharp is easier because it is a hybrid language with OO, which lets you lean on your previous knowledge as you adopt and get and used to the new functional bits. And because Haskell enforces purity and immutability and is a lazy language, writing real programs in it can be quite different to using other languages. And this means there can be a fair bit of upfront learning that you need to do in order to learn how to do things in a pure functional way. 
However, I don't think we should be surprised that this is the case. And I think it's unfair to compare it in the same way that we might compare a C-sharp developer picking up JavaScript. While C-sharp and JavaScript do have their differences, the syntax is still C-based, they're still imperative, mutable, strict evaluation languages. Haskell is much more different, as we've seen. It's not C-based, it's functional, it's immutable, and it has lazy evaluation. So naturally, things are going to be different. Another perspective on this is that learning functional programming properly is actually easier in Haskell because the whole language is geared for it. And so libraries and examples are always done in a pure functional style. And of course, because pure FP is quite different to normal imperative programming, it takes a little bit of learning to adjust. But you'll come out with a more sound understanding of FP principles at the end. Now, real Haskell programs require you to pick up many different functional concepts, such as functors, applicatives, monads, of which there are many, IO, state, maybe, either, reader, and writer, um, and many others. Uh, there's also monad transformers, uh, and foldable, and a, a whole bunch of others. So there's lots of new things to learn, but all of them are helpful abstractions that soon become as familiar to you as the strategy pattern or the observer pattern is in OO. Now, don't try to reach for your OO abstractions when you're trying to write FP code. Instead, think about the problem that they're originally designed to solve and, think of, and find out how that problem is solved using FP techniques instead. So for example, in FP, dependency injection is just function composition. It's important to realize that getting over Haskell's uh, learning curve is absolutely an achievable task. While concepts like monads and functors sound scary, uh, you don't actually need to be a genius or a math person to understand them. Like, I don't know any maths. I went to John's quantum computing stuff and he blew my mind with math. There are plenty of good tutorials online uh, and books to read that explain what these concepts are and why you choose to use them. And I'll recommend a few at the end. These abstractions aren't just academic and learning them is an investment that does pay off as they allow you to write declarative code that has minimal plumbing and that expresses intention more clearly because you've extracted that plumbing away from it. Haskell is a very deep language. Don't measure your progress by seeing how far you are away from knowing that everything that Haskell has to offer. Instead, focus on whether you, need to kn you know what you need to know in order to solve a problem that you have at hand. There are corners of Haskell that you'll probably never venture into. So am I saying if you want to do functional programming, you should, always use func you should always use Haskell if you want to be a real functional programmer? No, I'm not saying that. I would never say that Haskell should be used in all situations, and I don't think I'd say that about any specific technology. Unfortunately, the world is not black and white. It would be simpler if it was, um, and your personal requirements might be different to mine. If you don't feel ready to go whole hog on functional programming, purity and immutability, and you'd like to stay in familiar .NET or Java land, both f -sharp and Scala are competent languages and I do encourage you to go off and use them. With that said, I think you should consider Haskell if you've done some FP before in one of these hybrid languages and you're loving it, but you're getting frustrated when you have to cross over into that OO mutable part of the language. If you've seen how useful immutability and purity are and you want more of that, then Haskell will make you a very happy person. Haskell is quite different, but if you're willing to learn new things, it, it's extremely rewarding and absolutely within reach for those who have the patience to learn. And if correctness and clarity are of paramount importance to you, then Haskell is a really good choice because you can express your intention in a clear declarative style. So what sort of applications are good to write in Haskell? Well, anytime you want to do some data parsing or processing, Haskell is a really great choice. It's declarative style and great parsing libraries make that sort of problem a pleasure to solve. Any program with complex algorithms uh, is going to be really good to write in Haskell because you can write D DSLs very easily that make that code understandable and its type system and really good testing capabilities make ensuring correctness easy. Programs that consume web services or are web services are well supported in Haskell. There are really good libraries available for dealing with HTTP and JSON. And scripts and command line programs are also really good to write in Haskell. Uh, scripts can often grow out of control over time. They start out small and then end up getting really large. Uh, but Haskell static typing and its type inference helps keep your scripts correct but still concise. Haskell also has a really good command line argument parser library. It's probably the best I've ever used. And you probably shouldn't be surprised because Haskell's really good at parsing. However, Haskell isn't suited for everything just yet. So SQL databases are a surprising and annoying weak point, 
Um, if you're wanting to use Postgres, and you can use Postgres, then it'll be fine, because there are some really good libraries for working for Postgres. But major commercial databases like SQL Server and Oracle, they have some support, but apparently it's not perfect, um, which is a shame. GUI desktop applications are also not Haskell's forte. There are some libraries to help you write, like GTK apps, but you can forget about WPF and XAML. And let's face it, if you're writing something new these days, it's probably for the web anyway. So the state of Haskell ecosystem document that Gabriel Gonzalez uh, keeps up to date on GitHub is a good place to look to see whether your particular problem is well suited to Haskell. So that's how I know about SQL databases, because I went into there and it says immature, and it gives some reasoning as well. So who else, use Haskell, who else in industry uses Haskell in production? Well, the highest profile use that I know of is at Facebook, where they use Haskell to fight spam. Uh, they developed the Haskell data access framework that allows them to quickly and efficiently access the data they need to figure out whether posts are spam or not, and then they write these rules in Haskell. Facebook have done a number of presentations about this, and you're able to find recordings on it um, if you just Google for it. Um, I know Seek has a couple of teams that work in Haskell to do some data processing and analysis, as well as internal APIs. It was at Seek that I got my production Haskell experience. Um, there's also Helium and Circuit Hub, if you want to look up what they do. Now, if you want to learn Haskell, I highly recommend the Haskell Programming from First Principles book, uh, otherwise known as the Haskell book. It starts from the beginning, and it goes into sufficient detail, and it doesn't gloss over things. And it has exercises along the way that you can do if you want to cement these concepts in, the he in your head, because often you, you can stare at them, and then you go, uh, I still don't get it, and it wasn't, isn't until you actually do it a few times, then it clicks. So that having those exercises put out for you really helps. There's also Learn You a Haskell for Great Good, so if you want to read something for free online, you can have a look at that. Um, but you know, if you've got a, if you've got some spare cash, I really do recommend buying a Haskell book. It's a much better resource. Um, there's also maybe Haskell with some pragmatic examples about why you should care about FP and Haskell, Haskell subreddit, um, obviously Stack Overflow, and there's some Haskell tagged posts on the FP Complete blog, which have some good practical advice for production Haskell as well. So wrapping up. We took a lightning tour of many of the features that Haskell offers us developers to make reading, writing, and maintaining correct code easier. Haskell's strong static typing system allows us to refactor fearlessly by getting the compiler to check our correctness. Type inference and Hoogle make it easy to work with that type system and find the functions that we need. Some types help us model our alternatives explicitly, freeing us from, among other things, the tyranny of unexpected null references. New types help us model our domain types more explicitly and provide clarity and make that type system wor work for us, all for the runtime cost of zero. Immutab immutability and purity help us write simpler, more understandable code that can be used in concurrent systems safely. And function purity, and along with Haskell's easy support of value semantics and property testing, make testing our code for correctness easier. And laziness helps us write more declarative code that will still execute efficiently, but we do need to keep an eye out for those space leaks. And Haskell makes it easy to write fast, scalable, concurrent code on its green threading system because it natively supports asynchrony, asynchrony and makes testing concurrent libraries uh, and, and has those powerful concurrent libraries. And of course, immutability and concurrency go very, very well together. So hopefully you've enjoyed your peek into the Haskell universe and you can see how it can help you as a developer and now you want to go find out some more. Rest assured that I've only touched lightly the surface of what Haskell is about, even though I've kind of ranted for like an hour. Um, so I put these slides up on GitHub, so the link is up there. Please take a picture or memorize it if you've got a great memory. Um, I'm also on Twitter, so feel free to contact me there. If you see me around the conference, just look out for the bright green jumper and you'll find me in a crowd. I'm happy to take any questions, although I think I'm a little bit over time. So I am actually going to the .NET Rocks interview just after this. So, and I believe they do do a Q&A. So um, maybe come have a chat to me quickly after that and then I've got Nick up there and maybe come and ask me live in front of an audience a question, embarrass me or something. Thank you.